His word can be trusted. His word still comes true. God's Word, the Bible, answers life's deepest questions. Receive the Word, a message of hope for today. Thank you for tuning in to today's special Christmas broadcast of Receive the Word, a ministry of the Seventh-day Adventist Church in Southeast Michigan. My name is Pastor Jim Howard, and I'm here with my co-host, Pastor Joe Reeves. And today's topic is All I Want for Christmas. And as is our custom here on Receive the Word, we're going to begin our program with a message from our ministry partner, Pastor John Bradshaw from It Is Written. So we invite you now to open your heart to receive the word through today's special Christmas message. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was the governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, everyone into his own city. I'm John Bradshaw. Thanks for joining me today. It's that time of year. The Christmas music has been playing in stores for weeks. Christmas meals have been planned down to the last mince pie. The trees are up, real ones and artificial ones. Family gatherings have been anticipated for ages and people have traveled often many miles to be with relatives. The kids are going to get to see grandma and grandpa again. Retailers are either breathing easy or licking their wounds. Christmas lights are twinkling. Carolers have gone out spreading Christmas joy. Work parties have been attended, bonus checks have been gratefully received, Christmas cards have been sent and received from long ago friends and distant relatives. Catalogs from companies you didn't even know existed have arrived in your mailbox. People are planning to enjoy one last splurge before starting their diet in the new year. Cantatas have been enjoyed, the hallelujah chorus has moved hearts Nativity scenes grace front yards. Some people are enjoying a white Christmas. And where I grew up, people are heading to the beach and trying to avoid sunburn. Christmas. Andy Williams saying that it's the most wonderful time of the year. It's hard to argue with that. At Christmas time, people tend to be happy. Life slows down for a day or two. Long enough for people to connect with loved ones and friends. And in this culture of ours, A major Christmas tradition is gift-giving. In fact, you could say that maybe it's the overriding Christmas tradition. We know that Christmas is a religious tradition, a biblical tradition. It's a Christian tradition. Yet even atheists participate in celebrating Christmas and in giving and receiving gifts. In fact, if you went to any shopping center at all, you'd get the impression that Christmas is all about the gifts. Every Christmas season, all across the fruited plain, Children sit on Santa's knee and tell him that they want bicycles and Lego sets and scooters and dolls and video games and a whole lot more beside. Adults will be wanting clothes and golf clubs and iPods and camera gear and video games and a whole lot more beside. What do you want for Christmas? Some years ago, I asked several people to tell me about the best gift they'd ever received. Now, their response didn't really surprise me. I know for a fact that some of them had over the years been given some pretty impressive and expensive gifts, but not one of them told me that the best gift they'd ever received was a new car or a vacation in Hawaii or a new flat screen television set. Each of them told me a similar story. It was in every case something like, I remember years ago, it was my birthday and my daughter, she was just little then, She went and made me a beautiful card and she decorated it and she wrote the sweetest things on there. And you know, I've still got that card 
Nothing I've ever been given means as much to me as that card does. It wasn't the diamond ring, it wasn't the fur coat, it wasn't a Rolex, but something from the heart, something simple, something pure, something that represents true, genuine love. Doesn't that sound like Christmas? Really, when you stop and think about it, overeating, overspending and overindulging don't have a whole lot to do with the birth of Jesus. So what really matters most at Christmas time? How would you end the sentence if you were to say, all I want for Christmas is? What would make Christmas truly special for you? What's the essence of the Christmas story? I'm sure you might be able to answer that question in any number of ways. But there's a Bible verse that, for me, brings us back to the very heart of it all. John 3, verse 16 says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The reason Christmas is observed at all is that long ago the decision was made that Jesus would be given to the human family. God gave And he gave the greatest and most expensive gift that could possibly be given. Remember how the prophet Isaiah put it in chapter 9 and verse 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. Notice, unto us a son is given. Beyond the Christmas lights on the houses, beyond the Christmas trees, beyond the mountains and mountains of wrapping paper, beyond the last-minute Christmas shopping on Christmas Eve, men, you know what I mean, beyond everything, Christmas as a Christian tradition stems from the fact that God sent Jesus into the world. And what did He do that for? As John 3 and verse 17 says, For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. God was so committed to giving you and me every opportunity to experience character transformation. He was so committed to you and me being forgiven and cleansed and freed from guilt. God was so committed to us having everlasting life that He gave the greatest gift given ever by anyone to anyone ever. He gave Jesus. He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You know, there have been some pretty remarkable gifts given over the years. Russian business tycoon Roman Abramovich bought his girlfriend a $14 million sculpture. English soccer player David Beckham is said to have spent 80,000 pounds on a bag for his wife. An American movie star evidently bought a 200-year-old olive tree for her movie star husband for $18,000 for a tree. A musician bought his son a car for his 16th birthday. A $360,000 car. Too bad the boy didn't have his driver's license yet. An Indian businessman bought his wife a $60 million luxury jet for her 44th birthday. His brother obviously felt the heat, and so he bought his wife a luxury yacht shortly afterwards, worth more than $80 million. Of course, there's India's Taj Mahal. That was a gift given by an Indian emperor to his deceased wife. Impressive gifts. But are they the gifts that really matter most? In a moment, what really does matter most at Christmas? And Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was, that while they were there, the days were accomplished, that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. The 
The Bible reveals a conflict that began in heaven and continues on earth to this day. In the book, The Great Controversy, this battle between good and evil is traced from its origin to its ultimate and glorious conclusion. Between the pages of this fascinating book, vivid portrayals of Christian history are given. The destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD, the persecutions of the Middle Ages, the shining light of the Reformation, and the worldwide religious awakening of the 19th century. The Great Controversy then looks into our climatic future, the test of faith at the end of time, the second coming of Jesus Christ, and the glories of the earth made new. Today, this amazing book can be yours at absolutely no cost. Order by visiting our website at receivetheword.com. That's receivetheword.com. Or you can call us at 734-506-8188. That's 734-506-8188. And ask for your free copy of The Great Controversy. Order now to learn how God's love will triumph over evil and how that same love can give peace and purpose to your life today. said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of a heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. Thanks for joining me today. Even though Jesus was not born on December the 25th, it's become the day on which the Christian world remembers that great event when Jesus was born in Bethlehem, when the Messiah came into the world to be its Savior. Christmas in the Western world is characterized by family gatherings, house decorating, food consuming, gift giving. And sometimes it seems as though we might just miss the point. As you look around, would you really get the impression that Christmas is actually about Jesus? What does it look like? It's more about sales and stuff and possessions. I remember one Christmas seeing a young boy who'd forgotten all about the gifts that he was given, but he was having the time of his life playing with the wrapping that the gifts had come in. He was having more fun with a plastic bag than he ever did with the expensive toys that he'd been given. I hope yours is a very happy Christmas. So let me ask you, what would make this Christmas happy for you? And what would you really like for Christmas? And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all they that heard it wondered those things which were told them by the shepherds. This Christmas, while you're enjoying your mashed potatoes at Grandma's annual Christmas feast, there are some people who won't be getting very much or giving very much because they simply don't have very much. Someone just this week lost a job and there's no money for extras. Someone this week found out that insurance won't cover that claim. Now they're in a jam. Someone yesterday, perhaps, found out that the investments they'd made to fund their retirement have collapsed. Now they're not going to have nearly as much as they thought they would. So at Christmas, what really matters? Is it the stuff Is it the gifts and the Christmas tree and the lights on the outside of the house? What really matters this Christmas? Now, let's think about this from God's point of view. When we think about what we want for Christmas, that's one thing. But what would God want? If God had a Christmas wish list, what do you think would be on it? If God said, all I want for Christmas is, how do you think he would finish that sentence? World peace? Sure, God would want that, wouldn't he? Full churches? In many cases, no doubt. No more war or violence in the streets? Surely God would want to see an end to oppression and racism and hate and violence of all kinds. But as important as those things are, they're secondary 
That is, peace in the world can only come when there's truly peace in the heart. In the Proverbs, God tells us what he wants for Christmas. In Proverbs chapter 23 and verse 26, God says, My son, give me thine heart and let thine eyes observe my ways. God asks for your heart this Christmas. It's a simple request, but it's not always easy for people like you and me to fulfill. Now, what do I mean by that? By saying it isn't always easy for a person to give his or her heart to God. As sinful human beings, we wrestle with our own will, our own desires and wants. And sometimes giving God our heart seems like the toughest thing of all. Now, Not to give God our heart would be for us to make the same mistake as it was made by the people of Israel when Jesus came the first time. John wrote that he came unto his own and his own received him not. Think of who the people were who were prepared to meet Jesus. A few humble shepherds and some wise men from a foreign country. Then there was Anna and there was Simeon, but in a country that was built upon the hope of the coming of the Messiah, that was precious few. When Jesus came to the earth the first time, that first Christmas, his parents couldn't even find a place for Jesus to dwell. I sincerely hope it won't be that way this Christmas. Christ is looking for a dwelling place this Christmas, not a stable, not an inn. He's looking for a heart. My son, my daughter, give me your heart, God asks. Paul wrote to the Ephesians and discussed the hope in Ephesians 3 and verse 17. We read there, Ephesians 3 and verse 17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. And in Revelation 3 and verse 20, the same Jesus is looking for a place to rest. And he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. What's most important this Christmas? As important as some of the trappings and even the traditions of Christmas have become, surely the most important part of Christmas is Christ. Not simply the historical Christ, the baby in the manger, but the present day Christ looking for lodging, looking to see if you'll give him the best gift you could give him, the gift of your heart the gift of your life. And Simeon blessed them and said unto Mary his mother, Behold, this child is set for the fall and rising again of many in Israel, and for a sign which shall be spoken against. Yea, a sword shall pierce through thy own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. In Matthew 4, 4, the Word of God says, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Every Word is a one-minute Bible-based daily devotional presented by Pastor John Bradshaw and designed specifically for busy people like you. You can watch Every Word at our website, receivetheword.com. That's receivetheword.com. Receive a daily spiritual boost. Watch Every Word. You'll be glad you did. Here's a sample. Astronomers in Australia announced a few years ago that they'd calculated the number of stars in the sky. 70 sextillion. That's 70,000 million, million, million. 70 followed by 22 zeros. That's more stars than there are grains of sand in all the Earth's deserts and beaches. And the astronomers say their number is likely way too low. In Psalm 8, verses 3 and 4, we read these words. When I consider thy heavens, the works of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him? God has made a universe that vast, and yet he is still mindful of the human family. We serve a great and a big God. If he made all that, and he did, you can be certain he can take care of you and your burdens today. Let's live today by every word. And 
she was a widow of about four score and four years, which departed not from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. And she, coming in that instant, gave thanks likewise unto the Lord, and spake of him to all them that looked for redemption in Jerusalem. My dad told me many years ago about the gift that meant most to him. The Christmas in question was many years before and a number of years before I was born. One of my older brothers had wanted to buy dad a gift, so he scraped together what was then only a few cents and went and bought dad a little bar of shaving soap. And that touched my father's heart. It was more special to him than any other gift he'd ever received. What do you think that was? Because it came from the heart. It was given with love and a lot of it. The innocent, giving, self-sacrificing love of a little boy doing something sweet for his daddy. See, that's what's really important. A gift that's given from the heart. This year, I wonder what you'll give Jesus for Christmas. I'm sure I can safely say that he doesn't really want or need anything that you could buy at a department store or anything you could order online. But Jesus wants something given from the heart. In fact, he wants your heart. Just a small thing, but it's what he wants from you and from me. Can you give Jesus your heart this Christmas? And when they had performed all things according to the law of the Lord, they returned into Galilee to their own city, Nazareth. And the child grew and waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. We wish for you a Christmas filled with the love and presence of God. Whatever your circumstances this year, we hope you'll remember that God so loved the world that he gave. The birth of Jesus represents the givingness and the love of a great God, a God who inspired the Bible writer to write, He that spared not his own Son, but delivered him up freely for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Receive the Word is a ministry of the Seventh-day Adventist Church in Southeast Michigan. If you've enjoyed listening to this broadcast and would like to visit a Seventh-day Adventist church near you, please go to our website at receivetheword.com. At receivetheword.com, you'll also find media and materials that will help you better understand the Bible and draw you closer to Jesus Christ. So visit receivetheword.com today. Welcome back to Receive the Word. This is Pastor Jim Howard, Senior Pastor of the Metropolitan Seventh-day Adventist Church in Plymouth, Michigan, and the New Beginning Seventh-day Adventist Church in South Lyon, Michigan, and I'm here with my associate, Pastor Joe Reeves, and we want to thank you for joining us on Receive the Word today. Now, today's a special Christmas broadcast, and that was a wonderful message that we heard from Pastor Bradshaw that made me start thinking about what's really important at Christmas time. And uh, I remember back when I was younger, my family, we didn't always have a lot. Uh, and there was a period of time that um, we had to really struggle and lived on food stamps and other help and assistance that was given to us. And uh, I remember one year specifically when my mother uh, gave each of us just one gift and she made a stuffed animal for each of the kids. And we still talk about that Christmas, even though we've had lots of Christmases since then where we've been spoiled to the hilt. That Christmas, we still remember as a very special Christmas. And I think it just helps to highlight that really, if we think about it, Christmas is about family. It's about, uh, it's about that time with people who matter the most to you and that uh, gifts are a wonderful thing, but they certainly should not, uh, should not create the type of obsession that we have and that has taken over much of Christmas. So talk to us a little bit, Pastor Joe, about this meaning of Christmas and, and what really uh, Christmas is all about uh, so that we can not get caught up in what the society is leading us down. Yes, Christmas is a wonderful time of year. We have a lot of wonderful Christmas memories from this season. And it's it's time of the year when neighbors are actually neighbors instead of strangers. That's right. <laughs> and when you go to work, 
Uh, your coworkers are all about business the rest of the year, but at Christmas time, let their guard down a little bit, talk about personal things, uh-huh. family, checking in with each other. And it's just a nice uh, time of the year. At Christmas time, every person longs for a place to belong, mm-hmm. a home that is safe, loving, and enduring. What do we want on Christmas? We want a fireplace, some nice music, and people who love us. Amen. And well, unfortunately, though, not everyone, everybody who dreams of a happy Christmas gets one. Mm-hmm. In this broken world, too many of us find ourselves orphaned and alone, That's right. not only on Christmas, uh, but throughout the year. The families get torn apart by divorce. Best of buds become mortal enemies. The best ones among us get taken by death. We already know that material things such as houses and cars come and go. So when we lose friends and family, we're left with nothing, Mm -hmm. nothing, which is exactly what Jesus ended up with when he came to Bethlehem. When Jesus was born in that smelly barn, which is what Mm -hmm. Christmas is commemorating, when he was born in that smelly barn, he gave up his place of belonging so that we could have one, Mm -hmm. which is what Christmas is about. And, And the, 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 the longing of any human heart is to have a real home, a real place of belonging. That's right. That's right. And yet, what a contrast, because certainly God is offering us the gift of Jesus so that we can see that we're accepted in him. And yet, that belonging that he longs to give us uh, was not always reciprocated. We didn't always accept Jesus in the same way that he was so willing to accept us. And it makes me think about just how different that, that vast difference that exists between the glory that Jesus experienced before coming to this earth and the poverty that he had when he came. Um, one of my favorite passages in the Christmas story in Luke chapter two is when the shepherds are in the fields, keeping watch over their flock and the angel of the Lord comes and the glory of the Lord shines around them, and they become very afraid. And the angel says something very significant. He says, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. That word manger, of course, is another word for a feed trough. And uh, so I like to take out the middle words in here to help kind of bring home the significance of what must have been happening in these shepherds' minds when they heard this. They're, they're, they're told that there's going to be born a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And the sign is that he'll be lying in a feed trough. Christ the Lord, which gives you a picture of majesty and glory, lying in a feed trough, which gives you the exact opposite picture. And when we look at Jesus and his experience, we see someone who chose a very uh, humble lot. Um, I like what it says in Philippians 2 when it says he made himself of no reputation. Remember, Jesus was born of Mary, but not necessarily of Joseph and many in the town, uh, not necessarily believing that he would be born of the Holy Spirit, uh, probably ridiculed and 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 in many ways viewed Joseph and Mary and the baby that would be born of them of, of having no reputation. There was a great disdain that they had for Jesus because of this illegitimate uh, relationship that they that they supposed must have happened. And so Jesus made himself of no reputation. He was lying in this feed trough after his birth. And even when he became uh, the publicly known Messiah and became uh, known by some fishermen as as the one that they had been looking for. Uh, we have that passage in John chapter 1 where it says, what good thing can come out of Nazareth when they heard that they found the Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth? What good thing can come out of Nazareth? So even his hometown was one that was looked at very negatively, not the kind of place that someone would expect a king or someone to come out of. So you have this incredible picture of the humility, the lowliness of Christ lying in a feed trough, living in Nazareth of all places. And uh, I believe that that was because Jesus wanted to be able to relate 
to anyone in this world, any person, no matter how dark their circumstances, Jesus wanted to pass through that. He did not think it something special to, to be living in the glorious palaces of a king. No, he would rather be approachable to those who, who really had a difficult time in this world. Born in a barn. Born in a barn. That's I don't right. know about you. I was born in a hospital with white, <laughs> clean right. sheets, with doctors ready for an emergency. I was born in a higher place than Jesus. That's right. Now the the prophets had prophesied for hundreds of years, even thousands, that th this one would be born a deliverer to deliver this world. This wasn't just anyone who was born. The Old Testament prophets in Micah five two, he prophesied that this one who would be born in Bethlehem whose goings forth are from everlasting to everlasting. Mm -hmm. And it says in, in Micah 5, 2, But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me, the one to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. Mm -hmm. So even in the Old Testament, so this one who was, was born has been eternally preexistent That's with right. the Father. Mm -hmm. Jesus is the only one who was born who got to choose where he was born. That's right. Did you choose where you were born? No, I didn't. You didn't choose what family you were born into? <laughs> no, None I didn't. of it? Jesus, Jesus wrote his biography before his life. That's in the right. Old Testament, it was prophesied. And when Jesus chose where to, he, to be born, he scraped the very depths into the lot that he was born into, a humble family and a humble place. Isaiah 53 says, he, he shall grow up, and this is also a prophecy written hundreds of years before his birth. He shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness, and we, when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. Jesus was born a common man, uh, one of us. And in that place that he was born, Jesus was rejected right from birth because people when they were looking for a king that was prophesied in the old testament they were looking for one who would be born of the upper class mm, they right. jesus did not come the way that they expected and it, one of the most heartbreaking verses in the bible is john 1 verse 11 he says he came to his own mm. and his own receive did him not him. receive him mm. so jesus lowered himself that we might be exalted and that is that is the theme of of Bethlehem is seeing the paradox that Jesus gave up his place of belonging in heaven, left the throne of glory, the angels of heaven, and came down to the garbage pit of this world, this this dark hole, so that he could give us a mansion. Yeah. Beautiful thing. And it's well described in a in a book called Desire of Ages, page twenty five. It says Christ was treated as we deserve that we might be treated as he deserves. Mm. He was condemned for our sins in which he had no share, that we might be justified by his righteousness in which we had no share. He suffered the death which was ours, that we might receive the life which was his. With his stripes we are healed. Mm. That's from a beautiful book, Desire of Ages. If, uh, it's a harmony of the Gospels, and it has a beautiful description of Jesus' life. And we want to offer that as a special Christmas offer Amen. today for our listeners today. And you want to pull out your pen to write down the phone number. This is a special Christmas offer. And you can call in uh, to receive this book, Desire of Ages. It, it, of the 10,000 books in the Library of Congress on the life of Christ, this one is the most used and asked for. And you can claim your free copy of the book, Desire of Ages, and have it mailed to your address by calling us at 734 506-8188. You're going to want to call right now for your book, Desire of Ages, 734-506-8188. And Merry Christmas. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're in a gift-giving mood, Joe. I can't <laughs> wait to see season. what I'm... Yeah, that's right. <clears throat> well, um, you know, you're talking about this passage in John chapter 1, where it says <clears throat> that his own did not receive him. And in that passage in John chapter 1, it describes Jesus as the Word. And the way that we know that it's speaking about Jesus in John chapter 1 is what it says in verse 14. It says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, 
the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So it gives this picture that the Word, the the one who was with God and the one who was God, it says in verse 1, he became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. Now there's some real significance to this verse, and we want to talk about a couple aspects of it. The first is this idea of beholding his glory. To understand the significance of that, you really have to go all the way back to when God appeared to um, the children of Israel on Mount Sinai, when he gave them the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20. It's a fascinating story where God shows up in majesty. There's thunder and lightnings and, and smoke coming from the mountain. There's a great earthquake, and there's such awe and majesty connected with God's presence there and his voice, which comes booming from the sky with the Ten Commandments, that the children of Israel were afraid. They were frightened. And they said, Moses, you, you go find out what, uh, what God wants us to do, and we'll, take, we'll do it. But we don't, if we look upon God, we won't live. And uh, this is a very interesting statement and one that then is, is referenced later in Deuteronomy uh, chapter 18, where, it kind of, where Moses kind of describes this. He says in Deuteronomy 18 and verse 15, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your midst, from your brethren. Him you shall hear according to all you desired of the Lord your God in Horeb in the day of the assembly. He's talking about at Sinai on when the uh, Ten Commandments were given, saying, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, nor let me see this great fire anymore, lest I die. So he's describing this picture. Now, of course, we have the same thing happen when Moses later says, Please show me your glory, uh, which he says later in Exodus. And the Lord says, uh, I'm going to pass by you, but I'm only allow you to see my back. You can't see my full glory. So back in Deuteronomy 18, after Moses is describing this reality, he says in verse 17, And the Lord said to me, What they have spoken is good. In other words, the Lord sees that there's an important aspect here that, that it, he needs to be able to come close to people just like they need, but he can't come in all his glory because they wouldn't be able to live in the presence of the fullness of his glory. And so you get this prophecy that is given as a result of this. He says, what the, they have spoken is good. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brethren. Now he's talking about the Messiah. He's talking about Jesus. And will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. And it shall be that whoever will not hear my words, which he speaks in my name, I will require it of him. Now, he goes on later to, uh, to say even more things will happen. But the bottom line here is, he says, look, I understand that there's an important role here. It's good what they're asking for. I, I want to dwell among them. And, and I'm going to raise up a prophet who's, I'm going to put my words in his mouth and what he says, they are going to need to listen to that. They may not be understanding fully what's being said now, but when Jesus comes and they're able to see the fullness of who I am, then it will, they'll be accountable for that. And this is an incredible thing. When you get later into the gospels and you see John the Baptist show up, the people ask, are you that prophet? Not just are you a prophet, but are you that prophet? Are you the one that God promised through Moses to send to us whose words we must hear or else it will be required of us? Later, uh, when Jesus fed everyone by the loaves and the fishes, people were saying, truly, this is that prophet speaking again of the Deuteronomy 18 promise of a Messiah. They have been would looking be raised for up. thousands of years. For thousands of years they've been looking. And they're now thinking, wow, there's, there's so much supernatural uh, uh, you know, influence here. This has got to be something special. Could this be what we've been waiting for? Could this be the one? And uh, ultimately, Jesus then, uh, when he is on the Mount of Transfiguration and and, and there's that great story where he's transfigured and takes on his glorious uh, appearance and Moses and Elijah appear as well. God speaks out of heaven and he says, this is my beloved son, hear him. And this really is God saying, this truly is the one that I promised to you. 
that it, you there he God winked at our ignorance in the fact that we couldn't fully see his glory in Old Testament times. But here now, humanity has been given something very special. The full glory of God, Paul says, is seen in the face of Jesus Christ. And when God wanted to, to express himself, he came down as a man and shrouded his glory in humanity. And that humanity allowed us to be able to see what God is like. And we now have the Gospels. We have the story of the prodigal son and the healing of the leper and the bloody sweat of Gethsemane and the crying out from the cross, Father, forgive them for they know, they know not what they do. We have the wonderful statement of John 3.16 that whosoever believes can receive eternal life. All of these things are would not have been had God not sin, said that is what they ask for is good and I'm going to raise up a prophet. And now that we have all of that, now that all of that has been given to us, he's very clear that he now requires a decision from us. Jesus came to this world. It was the greatest gift that could be given. Amen. And there's two sides to this. And one is that you, you read from the Old Testament that it was prophesied that he would come down from heaven mm -hmm. to reveal God and to, to bestow the gifts of heaven in this world. The other side of this is how low he came. He became one of us. That's and right. uh, it says in, in John 1, 14, the word became flesh, just like our own flesh, dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Later, the New Testament prophets describe that fuller, the fact that Jesus became one of us. And of course, in the Bible, there's so many different titles for Jesus. He's wonderful counselor, almighty God. He's our king. He's everything to us. But one of the titles that really grabs my attention is in the book of Hebrews, when it specifically gives him, I'm going to read this first, but specifically gives him the title of brother. Mm. Jesus being brother, like parallel to me, he became one of us. And of course, that's what any of us are looking for in a leader is a leader who identifies with us. Politicians know that mm -hmm. when they were setting up their political campaign, they set up their campaign in such a way so that the, the public knows that they identify with them. I remember driving in, in Ohio once and it was a, a local campaign. I think it might've been a city mayor. I don't remember the name on the yard sign, but I remember the slogan. Mm -hmm. It said, one of us. Mm. I thought, <laughs> That's what we have in Jesus. Emmanuel, God with us. <laughs> God with us. So he has this title. We don't only really call God Father, but when we have Jesus, we have him as our brother. So it says, that's what it says in Hebrews 2.17. Mm -hmm. Therefore, in all things he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest and things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. Mm -hmm. Jesus subjected himself to the temptations that we go through, and he resisted the temptations. Jesus experienced the pain that we experience in this world. Right. The rejection that we experience, Jesus was rejected. Mm -hmm. And when he looked around at the filth of this world, he decided he wasn't ashamed to be called our brother. And that's what it says back in verse 11. For both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one, for which reason he, that is Jesus, is not ashamed to be called or to call them brethren. Jesus mm. isn't ashamed to call me a brother. Mm. That blows my mind. That he lowered himself down to our level. It's kind of described well in an anonymous poem that I picked up a few years that I love. It says, he descended that we might ascend. He became poor that we might be rich. Mm -hmm. He went hungry that we might be fed. He was thirsty that we might be satisfied. He was stripped that we might be clothed. He was rejected that we might be accepted. He was a man of sorrows that we might have joy. Goes on and on and on. He was mm -hmm. bound that we might go free. He died that we might live. And he was born in a barn that we might live in a mansion. Mm -hmm. It's the best Christmas gift ever. Amen. You know, when Jesus, you have to think about the timing of when Jesus came to this earth. Um, we have the Old Testament scriptures that describe the people of Israel 
and in Malachi is the last book of the Old Testament. There's 400 years between Malachi and the coming of Jesus. And during that period, you know, they, they had waited for so long on the Messiah. But the reality was the longer they waited, the more corruption would come into the people of God. And while there was a lot of idolatry and that sort of thing in Old Testament times, after, uh, you know, later they were taken captive by Babylon and then then they were, Babylon was conquered by the Persians and the Persians allowed the children of Israel to go back and restore, rebuild the temple, restore their um, national uh, civilization and, and the, the types of laws and things that governed them. And when they went back, they turned corrupt in a different way. And they became what we see when Jesus comes as the Pharisees, right? Where they're, they've made a total mockery of religion. They've made it all about uh, man-made requirements and there's hypocrisy and all of this stuff is going on. You have to imagine the angels, seraphim, cherubim, and the Bible refers to other beings that we don't know, principalities and powers and heavenly places. And as they look down upon the earth during this corrupt time, you have to imagine how, what they must be thinking about, you know, if they were God, what they would do. (laughs) They, you know, I mean, they saw what happened at the flood. I mean, I could see they were thinking the same thing at this time. But right at that time, when you would think God would just wipe that corruption off the earth, instead, Jesus became one of us. Just at the time when humanity was looked upon with the greatest disdain, Jesus elevated humanity. Yeah. For for students of history, you see at that time period, humanity was slipping lower than ever. That's right. And that's right when Jesus broke into our world to save us. That's right. And he didn't just come as an outsider coming in to help us. He became one of us. He became a man. In other words, the moment that he became a man, he elevated humanity. Ultimately, I think this is beautifully described in the book of Ephesians chapter 2, where it says that God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. What does that mean? Raised us up and made us sit in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Who's us? That's humanity. When Jesus became a man and then he was resur- died and was resurrected and went back up to heaven, look, when those angels and 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 those beings in heaven look upon the Son of God, they're looking upon a man. <laughs> they're looking upon humanity. And he en- ennobled and elevated humanity so that we do not need to be ashamed anymore because he was not ashamed to, to call us brethren. And that's such a powerful thing. We have to understand God did not just give Jesus for us. He gave Jesus to humanity. That's a gift that's very different than how we often think of it. I think of that beautiful, most well-known passage of Scripture in John 3.16. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. He didn't just give him for us to die for our sins. He gave him to us to ever ennoble and bear the form of humanity. When Jesus resurrected, he didn't take some other form. He had hands and feet and scars. He still bore that human form and and gave evidence through that glorified human form that he was going to bear his humanity forever, forever being one with humanity and elevating us because God didn't just give him for us. He gave him to us. That's what it says in Isaiah when he, when he was writing in poetic form under inspiration. He saw the one that would be born. It says in Isaiah 9, 6, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Mm. That baby boy that was born was given to us as a gift from heaven to elevate humanity. Mm. And the government will be upon his shoulder and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Amen. That's a prophecy of, of Jesus. And, and the angels sang about it again when they were meeting with the uh, the shepherds, the lowly shepherds on the hills of Bethlehem, those poor angels, they were looking for people to share their joy with when they saw this gift that was given to our planet. And the angels flew over Jerusalem and they saw 
the hardened hearts, even of the religious leaders of the time who were looking for the Messiah in a different way, but they found the lowly shepherds mm. whose hearts were open That's right. and they sang to them. And when, when they broke forth in singing and, and Luke two eleven, they said, for there is born to you this day in the city of David, a savior who is Christ the Lord. Mm. Those angels who said that they saw Jesus in his glory and they saw Jesus in his humiliation. They understood like none other the gift that was being given to us. That's right. Born to you. Unto you uh, a child is born. I mean, it's incredible to think that this is a this really is a gift from God. A gift to I want to claim this season again. And that's right. No question. And you know, it's this fact that we're talking about right now. The fact that Jesus did not merely do something for us. He didn't just do something for us but he was a gift given to us. And it's because of this fact that at this holiday season, this Christmas season, each one of us is faced with a question. And it's a question that ironically was asked by Pontius Pilate on the day of Jesus' crucifixion. You'll recall uh, in that story that, uh, that there was an offer being given to let one prisoner go free. And uh, there was a struggle over whether or not Barabbas uh, was going to be let free, a, a criminal who was clearly guilty, or whether or not they wanted the crowd wanted to allow Jesus of Nazareth to go free. And so Pilate asks a question when he, he says, who do you want me to release to you? And they say, Barabbas. He follows it up with this question. He says, what then shall I do? with Jesus, who is called Christ. What shall I do with Jesus, who is called Christ? And you know what? That's really the question of the Christmas season. What will we do with this gift that was given to us? It makes me think, have you ever received a gift that you, uh, that you didn't want? Now, it might be something that you wanted, but it might not be the one that you wanted. <laughs> I think of, uh, you know, for instance, I might need a tie, but I might not be sure how I feel about wearing a clip-on tie at the Ow. age of 40 or 50 years old or whatever. Now, my wife and I would handle this differently. I have to be honest. I feel like the person giving me the gift would rather I use what they gave me. And it was the thought that mattered, not the actual gift. So I generally would return the clip-on tie for something that I actually like, thinking that that was their intent. But my wife, were she a man in order to receive a clip-on tie. She would be the one who would be a little more likely to keep the clip-on tie, hang it in her closet, look at it every day because she doesn't want to hurt the person's feelings, even though she would never wear it, except maybe when they come to visit. <laughs> and my wife, that, she's just really sweet like that. Now, it probably would have been easier for either of us if the person hadn't given us the clip-on tie in the first place. But that really isn't an option. As soon as the gift is placed in your hands, You've got to do something with it, don't you? You've got to do something with it. <laughs> the gift is given. Unto us a son is given. What are we going to do with it? Unto us a child is born. Humanity just can't bury its head and pretend that the gift was never given. On the contrary, every man, every woman, every child is now faced with the question posed by Pilate, what shall I do with Jesus who is called Christ? You know, I hear some people... They say, well, see, Pastor, I've accepted the gift of Jesus. I put him in my yard with Mary and Joseph every year. I make sure he's on all my Christmas cards. And that would be fine if Jesus was merely given for us, but he wasn't. He was given to us. So the question is more than what you did with the story of Jesus, but what are you doing with the person of Jesus? What are you doing with the living Christ? How are you relating to him today? Are you seeking his will? Are you following what he reveals to you? Or are you putting him on a shelf? Or have you returned him long, long ago? The Bible says in John 1 and verse 11 that Jesus came to his own and his own received him not. They had all sorts of reasons why they didn't want that gift. He wasn't kingly enough. He wasn't popular enough. His teachings didn't match what they were taught as a child. The renowned scholars didn't agree with him. The cost that he made of following him was too high. Various different reasons. But they had to do something with Jesus. And the gift keeps on giving. Today, we are faced with the same question. You know, Christmas is popular today, but Jesus 
was never popular. You read in Isaiah 53, it said there was no beauty in him that we should desire him. So it really comes down to not whether or not we will accept the story of Jesus, but what will we do with the living Jesus who was given as a sacrifice for our sins? Ultimately, not just a sacrifice on the cross, but the sacrifice of all heaven in giving Jesus to come to this world and live in such a humble lot. And I don't know about you, Joe, but I don't want to get so caught up in the Christmas hoopla and the commercialism that I lose sight of the primary gift that's being given, and that's the salvation that is found alone in Jesus Christ. Don't want to get more caught up in putting Jesus in the yard and in the Christmas card than putting him in our hearts. Amen. And you can't put him in your heart unless you discover him in his word, unless you come to him in prayer. We have to take seriously our relationship with Jesus Christ on this Christmas season. That's the most honorable thing we can do for Jesus at Christmas time. And I know that's the experience I want as we're looking to the new year for 2014, wrapping up this year in Christmas season. Let's put Jesus first. That's that's what we can do Christmas time. And I hope that our listeners will do that as we're making that special appeal to our own hearts and to yours that we'll receive the gift that was given. Well, we want to thank you for tuning in to today's special Christmas edition of Receive the Word. And as we conclude another program, we encourage you once more to follow the example of Acts chapter 17 and verse 11, to receive the Word with all readiness and to search the Scriptures every day. So for Pastor Joe Reeves, I'm Pastor Jim Howard, praying that the Lord bless and keep you until next time on Receive the Word, and have a very Merry Christmas. Receive the Word is a ministry of the Seventh-day Adventist Church in Southeast Michigan. For more information, go to receivetheword.com. That's receivetheword.com. Or you can call 734-506-8188. That's 734-506-8188. You can also write to us at Receive the Word, P.O. Box 23357, Detroit, Michigan, 48223. That's P.O. Box 23357, Detroit, Michigan, 48223.